horror fans, welcome back to Room 237 as I continue my month of October marathon of horror anthology films. And I have yet again another one from Amicus Productions, 1971's The House That Dripped Blood. Not to be confused with the Christmas slasher film The Dorm That Dripped Blood, which I've also reviewed. Uh, so this came out a year before Asylum, which was my last review. And it again stars Peter Cushing, and this time also has Christopher Lee. That alone is pretty awesome. But we also have um, uh, Ingrid Pitt, who was also in uh, uh, The Wicker Man, along with Britt Eklund, who was in uh, Asylum. They were both in Wicker Man, but this one has Ingrid Pitt. Uh, Joss Eklund, John Pertwee who is actually Sean Pertwee's father. So Alfred from Gotham, his father's in this. And The House That Dripped Blood sounds like a slasher film, and it's rated PG. There's not any blood in this whatsoever. Uh -huh. Someone actually does get killed with an axe, but we don't see it. Uh, the blood that's right here, that's the most of blood the most blood that's associated with this film. I guess except for like the vampire story. Uh, it was directed by Peter Duffel, who was actually cited by Christopher Lee as Britain's most underrated director. So that's quite a compliment. Uh, it has four stories, and um, all of which were based on short stories by... Uh, Robert Block, the novelist uh, that wrote Psycho. He wrote the screenplay for these, as he did for Asylum. And I'm seeing that the more uh, amicus anthologies that I watch, the better they get. I mean, the first one, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, was okay. It was all right for being, like, the first uh, of its kind. Then I saw Asylum, which was a little better. And I actually like this one a lot. Um, I would say Peter Cushing's performance in Asylum is a little bit stronger, more powerful and engaging, but he's still very good at this. It does have one of my favorite Christopher Lee performances as well. Uh, some trivia behind it is I know Peter Duffel originally wanted to call it Death in the Maidens. Because there's a, a piece of music that's used throughout it by the same name. But I, I, the studio did think that was a very good title. I would happen to agree. Uh, Michael Dress did the music, which parts of it is kind of eerie. Like uh, the opening credits. It has like a gothic organ put in front of. I don't know what kind of instrument it would be. It was... It's used in a lot of horror movies. Kind of sounds like a fast woodpecker sound. Like a dull woodpecker sound. <clears throat> um, it actually has probably my favorite segment out of all the Amicus films that I've seen so far. Which would be the Christopher Lee story. Um, there's actually some uh, meta humor in the third story, which I really appreciate. Um, I think all anthologies have like one slightly humorous or totally humorous story. The humorous one in this actually pissed the producers off. They saw what they were doing and they were like, no, drop the comedy, go horror. <laughs> which is funny because the one that's actually funny, they wanted to not do. But I'll uh, get to that. <clears throat> uh, the direction of this, I think, even though Freddie Francis and Roy Ward Baker are better horror movie directors, uh, the way the Peter Cushing story and the Lee story are directed, I think is a lot tighter and more well done than most of the stories in House of Horrors and Asylum. Uh, the framework for this 
I, like Horrors in Asylum, it's, uh, I really don't know how to explain it. There's, so there's this big Victorian mansion. I mean, I, I think it's Victorian. It's a big ass mansion regardless. But this famous actor, uh, what's it? I, Her, Harry Anderson sounds familiar, but Harry Anderson is fucking Richie from 1990 It and the judge from Night Court. Uh, it's the character that John Pertwee is playing. His last name is Paul Henderson. Okay, Harry Henderson. God damn it. <clears throat> Famous horror actor Paul Henderson goes missing. And he was staying in said house. So the uh, this one inspector is called on the case. Uh, Holloway, played by John Bennett. And he starts talking to the real estate agent, played by John Bryans. And the real estate agent's name is Stoker. Possibly a nod to Bram Stoker, because there are several nods to not just Dracula, but sort of horror past. And he says the house has a history of strange occurrences and disappearances and he talks about the previous tenants before him that also had strange encounters and that it's the house itself so that that's our frame uh our framework uh the wraparound investigator looking for the latest tenant that's gone missing and hearing about all these other people that live there and those are our stories. So again, it's not like a story or a storybook or like a storyteller, like Creep Show or Tales of the Crypt. It is more like uh, uh, Amicus has more of like the uh, interesting story-driven sort of uh, framing devices, which I appreciate as well. The first story, as you can expect with an anthology, is the weakest of the bunch. But it's still uh, interesting enough. It's, it's called uh, A Method for Murder. And it stars of Denim Elliott, who's this writer, this horror writer. And his wife Alice, played by Joanna Dunham, they move into the house and... He's writing this novel, and he creates this character named Dominic, who is, I guess, the the whatever strangler of his story. And he starts to see visions that his character Dominic has, you know, leaped off the pages and is now real. And you start seeing him around the house and being kind of threatening. And... Uh, even though the look of Dominic is very simple, and I can see why some people would find it cheesy, because it is just like a gray mop top wig, sort of gray makeup, uh, you know, a messed up big yellow teeth, kind of a. Mm -hmm. But it, the the way it's edited, you know, he he sees them in, in like a mirror, standing behind him, stuff like that. It is done in a creepy way. And eventually, he, uh, because he ends up, uh, what was it? It is a bit of a forgettable story. It's entertaining enough, but it is still kind of forgettable. Uh, <clears throat> believe that the writer's kind of going crazy, so he has a doctor come over, starts talking to him, Dominic appears, strangles the doctor, and either the writer either has a heart attack or gets strangled as well. There's a twist and a double twist. Um, you find out, which, there's going to be spoilers, uh, 
So if this is an anthology that I do recommend. It is for free on YouTube. One other thing I want to say is I absolutely love 1970s, 60s and 70s uh, credits. How it's just the logo over the video with like the copyright underneath. I just, I love that. You don't see that in modern movies unless they're trying to emulate the feel of the 70s. Like Terrifier or All the Boys Love Me Lead. Highly recommend it. Especially if you if you're a Cushing or Lee fan, definitely check it out. But spoilers. Uh, I I guess also say you know th there's a vampire story, one about you know there's a creepy kid story that's the one with Christopher Lee, and then one that's kind of trippy and weird. It has to deal with a wax museum, so. <clears throat> But spoilers. <clears throat> you find out that uh, Dominic is actually played by an actor. He takes the wig, the teeth out. It's an actor who's the lover of the writer's wife. Who meant to only scare the writer away or have him declared insane to have him go away so she can inherit his uh, wealth. But... The guy took it a step further, had him and his doctor killed. But then when she tries to address him by his name, he says, that's not my name. My name is Dominic. So either Dominic is real and, or there was an actor and Dominic killed him that assumed his role because then he attacks and strangles her. And he kind of gets into the laugh and mannerism of Dominic. And that's how it ends. The uh, second story, I think it's called Waxwork. Uh, Waxworks. And a lot of these appeared in uh, Weird Tales uh, magazines back in like the 30s and 40s. So this is one with Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing moves into the house... He's, uh, he gets incredibly lonely and he walks into town and he stumbles across this uh, wax museum, which seems to have, like, it's very dark. It's got, like, sort of like a torture positions and um, uh, murderers. And he sees one with a very lovely woman hold, hold, holding a, a uh, dinner platter. And he's transfixed by her beauty. Which earlier we see him looking at a photo of a very lovely woman. Guessing it's a woman from his past. <clears throat> but he's drawn to this wax figure. And again, <laughs> Peter Cushing brings so much class to every role he does. I mean, he is just... Again... I would say Asylum is more of like a powerhouse performance by him. But he's also very good and intense in this as well. And so he talks to the proprietor of the Wax Museum. It says how, you know, it's all uh, murderers. But this one woman attracts men from all over. They're all, as soon as any man see, sees her, they're transfixed. That night he has a dream, and the dream is one of the best scenes in the whole movie because, I mean, the camera starts, it gets pretty creative. I mean, it's doing stuff like this, and Peter Cushing is kind of uh, walking through the house, through all the fog. There's fog, there's like this very, it's all dark, but there's like, green and then purple and pink and blue it, it looks like a bava scene a very well shot bava scene <clears throat> and he starts seeing all the wax figures from the place all over the house and then he sees the the one with the plate still with the hair the dress only her face is a skull and yeah, it looks like a perfectly clean, white, plastic skull. 
almost like the teaser for Suspiria, where she's brushed her hair, turns around, skull. But with all the colored lights in the fog, it 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 is a very interesting, eerie imagery that I really love. Uh, he wakes up to a knock at the door. It's an old friend of his. They haven't seen each other for some time. They come in. They have a drink. He, His friend l looks down in the trash, finds the torn picture of the woman. We get the idea this woman came in between them in the past. <clears throat> well, anyway, they, they go down to town. He sees the wax museum. He wants to go in. He's transfixed by the figure. And then they leave. Uh, the friend says he has to be on his way. He leaves. Later on, he calls Cushing. It says, you know, he's he's obsessed. He's drawn to her. He has to go back. Cushing tries to tell him no. But he goes down to the wax museum. It sees that his friend has been turned into a wax figure. And that the proprietor had said... That the woman was his wife, who had been guillotined for killing his best friend. But now the twist is, is that I guess he had found them together. He killed his best friend, had her kind of set up for it. They guillotined her, but then he kept it and bombed her body. And, you know, made her into a... A figure so that she could be his forever but then she still draws the attention from men which sets off his jealousy and he then attacks that says that's why I killed your friend that's why I'm gonna kill you and he chases Cushing around with an axe uh, <clears throat> Uh, it might allude to how maybe those two might have been involved with that woman. Maybe that woman is the one from the picture. Maybe I'm looking too much into it. But and there's even a part where he swings the axe and he hits um, either her or another figure. And the face comes off and there's a skull underneath. So you get the idea all these figures or people. But eventually, Axe goes up, camera on Cushing as he screams. This other guy walks in, and we see, you know, this. We see her with the now wax-figured Cushing's head on the plate. Um, I would say, as well shot as this story is, and well acted, especially by Cushing, uh, I love the dream sequence. I think it just reminds me of like a Baba scene or some Italian film. I would say it's the one that doesn't really fit the film because it doesn't really have anything to do with the house. It's all down at the wax museum. It just so happens that Cushing was, was staying at the house at the time. The whole revelation at the very end of the film, I guess, does tie it in. But it mostly feels unrelated because it it mostly has to do with the wax figures at the wax museum. But yes, the the final quote at the end of the film does does make it relevant. Now the third one is called "Sweets to the Sweet," which I know people probably recognize as a saying from Candyman. It's also from Hamlet. The flowers that are put over Ophelia's grave in Hamlet. But I think it's also uh, a British slang or isn't it like canned bread or something? I, I heard Clyde Barker talk about it once. But this is the one Christopher Lee and this is my favorite story. Possibly my favorite story of all the Amicus segments that I've seen so far. And... So, <clears throat> Christopher Lee is playing a very Christopher Lee t type role. Very, you know, well-dressed, well-spoken, intelligent, rich guy. Who has a young, cute daughter named, was it Jan or Janet? 
I think it was Janet. Jane, played by Chloe Franks, which, was she in anything else as like a child actress? Oh, she was in Tales of the Crypt. She was in the, she was the daughter in the All Through the House segment. Okay. She's also in the Uncanny, so I'll get to see her in that. But, uh, so he, he has a very demanding job where he's going to be, uh, gone for a lot of the time. So he has to hire a private tutor because he won't send her to boarding school or public school. He's against her even going to a public playground with other kids. He doesn't want her to have toys or anything. He has her very shut off from the world. He, like... Her playroom is uh, the study with all the encyclopedias and books. So he hires this woman named Anne, who was played by uh, Neary Don Porter. And at first, uh, the way she plays the character, at first it seems like you don't really know her intentions. Like she kind of seems um, sinister. But she ends up being a very good tutor. And Jane has a very hard time opening up to her at first. She has a very bad fear of fire. And what I like about this story is it plays with your expectations. It's perfectly paced. Perfectly has the perfect uh, method of build up and set up and the payoff works. Because it starts off, so you think maybe Christopher Lee is just an abusive father. And even asks her, like, you know, is there a reason why you're afraid of fire? Like, were you or someone you love burnt? And she's like, no. And she keeps pushing to Christopher Lee about, you know, why can't we send her to school? Why can't we have her interact with other kids? Why can't we get her toys? And he refuses to really answer. Uh, he says how her mother died when she was just a baby. And eventually she says, well, can I get her some toys? So she comes in with the bag. There's some sort of coloring and uh, educational toys. And she gets her a doll. And Christopher Lee comes in. He scoffs at it and he throws the doll in the fire in front of the in front of Jane after she was just taken by it. So it plays off like he's just a very cruel, uh, somewhat abusive father. And of course, Lee plays it perfectly. And I kind of thought it was going the Twilight Zone uh, living doll route. Like maybe he's just an abusive parent and the kid is going to somehow find a way around it. <clears throat> uh, one night... Jane sneaks down uh, to the study, looks at the encyclopedias, starts reading a book. Next day, you know, and she always hides the book when Anne is around. And when Anne checks it, it's opened up to witchcraft. So now we're like, oh, okay. So she's starting to get into witchcraft. And it's, it's slowly building up. And which at one point, and I, I wish I could remember the exact order of these scenes because it is a perfect example of how to build something up. Like he doesn't even talk about her mother at one point, uh, and brings her up, and Christopher Lee very sternly says, "You know, uh, I was actually glad when she died," which sounds cruel. She's like, how could you say that? And he's like, because when she died, that was when I realized truly what she was. So, like, okay. Like, there's always something more at the end of every scene. And I really liked that about this segment. Uh, at one point, the power goes out. And he goes to get candles. But the box has far less candles than what should be in there. So... He calls down Jade. He asks her where the candles are. And she's just looking at him. And he hauls off and slaps her. Which. Uh, 
the way it plays out, you, you can tell Christopher Lee is just kind of like doesn't want to hit a child, which is good of him. Even though you know he's very serious, a British actor. So the, the, now we're like, okay, he's a totally abusive dad. And then, <clears throat> but also we already know she's studying witchcraft. We know candles are usually always used in witchcraft. The next scene, he's shaving with an electric razor. He has to go answer the phone. Jade comes in, takes the hair clippings. So, okay, she's definitely setting something up. So then he's at, I believe, the real estate office to sign the lease or whatever. And he he's writhing in pain about his arm. And we see it cuts to Jade in the study just laughing and stabbing. What we can guess is a doll, a, a voodoo doll. So then she has to hide that from Anne. That night he's laying in bed. He rises in pain again. Anne calls the doctor. Doctor can't find anything wrong. And that's what Christopher Lee finally explains to Anne. Like, okay. The reason why I treat Jane the way I do. Why I won't let her have anything like dolls. Or let her be near other children. Or anything else is because I'm afraid of her as I was her mother. And she was like, how can you be afraid of a child? He's like, it's not just a child. She's evil. Like those candles, I know she made a wax doll and is, is using it against me. You have to find it. And I really like the ending. I know some people will say, well, they should have showed it. They should have showed it. Which I know... I think it was, I think it was the producers that wanted more of like an R-rated film, so people would want to go see it. But it, it just didn't pan out that way. But uh, <clears throat> you know, Anne turns around, sees Jane holding the doll. She runs downstairs and she's standing by the fireplace, and she's like, "No, please give me the doll," and she tosses it in the fire. And as it does, we hear Christopher Lee screaming and agonizing pain. And it shows the doll melting. And it shows Jane just smiling uh, evilly at Anne. And some people, well, it should have shown, like, why did it have some big effect? Like, build up to that. This is one of those times where what you don't see is scarier. Like, we've already built up anything done to this doll creates pain for him so just showing it burn and melt we know he's we know he's feeling it so it's it's that stylized in a way that even though we don't see it it's still very effect possibly even more effective so i really liked that the build-up of the whole story was just perfect the way you know we think okay maybe she's just a very special like a, a special kind of child. Maybe she has some sort of incredible gift. That's why he's sheltering her. Oh, maybe he's just very abusive. Oh, maybe it's witchcraft to fight back. Oh, she's the daughter of a witch. Oh, he's actually terrified. You know, perfect buildup. So we get to the last story, which is the humorous one. It stars uh, John Pertwee as Paul Henderson, who's the actor that the inspector is uh, looking for. Now, I know, I, it was either the director or the producers wanted uh, Vincent Price. But, uh, this was during Price's contract with America International to do all their horror films, primarily by Roger Corbin. So he, he was unable to. Even if he had the time, he was unable to because he was under their contract. Now, I do agree with a lot of critics and even fans of this film that this would have been way more effective 
and fun, entertaining, and funny, even if it wasn't supposed to be. If someone like Vincent Price uh, was playing his role. But uh, John Pertwee did do a fine job. He actually did base his character off Christopher Lee. Because <laughs> he's basically this legendary horror icon that has acted since like the 30s. And he's doing this really low-budget, cheap vampire flick called Curse of the Bloodsuckers. And he's just unhappy with everything. Unhappy with the cheap production, unhappy with the costumes, the actors. Like, there's a part where he takes his cane and he just sends it through this, like, paper-thin wall that's been painted to look like a stone wall. And... The uh, meta humor that I found very funny was he was like, you know, they don't make them like they used to. You know, uh, Phantom of the Opera, Frankenstein, Dracula. And then he just looks down. He's like, uh, Bela Lugosi, of course. Uh, uh, I'm not that new fella, which, of course, is Christopher Lee. <laughs> Christopher Lee was, this was during his tenure as Dracula uh, for Hammer. So I thought that was... I thought that was uh, really funny. And, of course, Amicus is associated with Hammer. Uh, so I, I really appreciated that. And, I mean, I guess that was the humor that the producers did not like. And they they told them all to scrap it, but they had already shot so much that they just, from that point on, they just carried on with a horror tone. But it still had some of that comedy in it which I thought that worked yes it would have worked better if it had been a price but uh, a per tweet did just fine basically the story is he wants to go get a real authentic uh, a vampire's cloak so he goes to this place with this obviously vampiric looking guy uh, buys a cloak from him then when he walks away, the guy says, now I can rest in peace. So we always, he bought a real vampire's cloak. And another thing I found funny was, because uh, this is the one with uh, of Ingrid Pitt, who is also his character's co-star and girlfriend. They're doing this scene together when they're supposed to kiss, and then he's supposed to look up and, and reveal his fangs. But of course, he put it on. When, every time he puts it on, he turns into a vampire. Whenever he's wearing it. Like, when he first puts it on, he looks in the mirror, there's no reflection. Takes it off, he has it back. But when they do the scene, <laughs> like, his performance was fine the whole time. But then when he's acting, acting, <laughs> he's so over the top. Like, huh. Oh my, my lady, how? Like, purposely going way over the top, which I also thought that was funny. And so he, they kiss, and of course he actually bites her. And then when they call cut, you know, she slaps him, he takes the cloak off, he's like, what the hell was that? And it all builds up to him actually believing he's a vampire. He tries to prove it to her by having her over for dinner. Oh, he reads a news story saying that that store found a coffin with that guy's body. So he's like, oh, great. So I bought it from a real vampire. So she's like, well, go ahead and put it on. So he does, doesn't work. He sees the tag on it, it's just a costume. Twist, she's an actual vampire saying, we loved your movie so much, we wanted you to join us. And there was another humorous scene when he puts it on, he starts to like uh, levitate, he's like, uh, uh. thought that was kind of humorous. So then the epilogue is, you know, the inspector's like, I don't believe in this, you know, just let me go to the house, just let me look around. The realtor doesn't want to give him the keys, but he does goes to the house, goes down to the cellar, 
buys a coffin with Pertwee in it as a vampire. But, oh, was he just like died or fell over? Yeah, turns him into a, well, he, he kills Henderson, who was a vampire, but then uh, Pitt comes out and attacks him. And then the realtor comes out and talks to the camera, saying, you know, the house, uh, what was the exact quote? It, it reflects the personality of whoever is living in it and treats them accordingly. So, you know, perhaps the audience would be suitable and that there's nothing to fear if they're the right sort of person. And that hopefully the house will someday find is a rightful owner. So, like, oh, okay, so that does make the Cushing story more relevant. Because he is a lonely man longing for, you know, his lost love or whatever. And he's drawn to that woman that either is her or looks like her down at the Wax Museum. So even though it doesn't really take place at the house, it all revolves around a place outside the house. That ending does tie it in and make it more relevant than I had thought after I'd seen the segment. But I really liked this anthology. I liked it a lot. Um, it's my favorite Amicus one so far. Well, tied with Tales from the Crypt. Because I really liked that. But the, the Christopher Lee story is probably my favorite Amicus segment. Again, that, that to me is just the perfect way for a short story to have. You know, set up, build up, pay off. The, the right order of scenes to play with your expectations and an ending where it didn't have to show you anything and still be effective. I loved that. Uh, they all have a humorous story. I act, and This one wasn't supposed to be humorous because they didn't want comedy, but the comedy that was in it actually worked. <laughs> I... I really like the meta humor talking about how horror nowadays isn't what it is, which is more relevant now because I love horror of the 60s and 70s. But the whole joke about Bela Lugosi being better than the new guy and Christopher Lee being in this film, I, I found this very enjoyable. And, you know, if you watch this whole video, I highly recommend it. I had a lot of fun with it. So, yeah. How's that Drip Blood, 1971? Really fun anthology. Uh, thank you for watching. Oh!